All righty. Uh, my fellow old rollers, welcome to the show. Uh, head of Snake Pit USA, Catch as Catch Can coach Joel Bain, just all around general badass and one of my personal heroes. Joel, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, we're going to do a second try, right? But uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to the interview. I really am. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize for some of the audio issues that we had uh, leading up to this. Um, we've basically just come to the point where we, we are going to have to use this uh, alternate service to get the recordings because it, it really just had it where I was stepping all over you and just sounded like crap and it wasn't good. And I, I sincerely appreciate your willingness to tolerate my early incompetence and just let us you know come back and make up for it and fix it. No worries. You know, the only reason I even said anything was my OCD. I was like, I know we can do better. I know we can do better. You know, yeah. I, know I know you're serious about this, and I try to give my best when I do these things. So I figure maybe we can give another shot and pull something off a little better for, for the fans and people listening to your podcast and, and people that follow me and my grappling stuff and just give it a little something, something special. And it's nice when you do these, too, and people see your face. And they get the audio is nice to have, but I think a lot of people get more into this format lately. So it yeah. seems. I could be wrong. We, you know, it seems. I think a lot of us uh, are uh, currently uh, not necessarily as employed as we would like, so we have maybe the ability to watch as opposed to just listen. Uh, right. So I, I feel you on that too. Yeah. Well, uh, just to kind of get started, like you know, some uh, quick introductions. Um, man, you are a, a fairly accomplished guy. Um, you got the uh, former MMA fighter, and then uh, part of USA Wrestling uh, was both a, a wrestler and an assistant coach. Uh, for the uh, the Armed Forces team and the uh, sorry the Air Force team and USA Wrestling in general, correct? Correct. Yeah. Man, that's that's uh, awesome. Not a whole lot of people. I mean, like I think maybe Randy Couture is the only other person that, I, that I've heard of that that shares that same accolade. That's uh, Very, that's just. Where Randy is, you know, he's got a ton more accolades than I do, obviously with wrestling. Um, mm -hmm. So there may be some other guys I couldn't tell you for sure because when I was wrestling, it was. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, I think I told you before. I'll tell you again how I got drug into it. You know, because I didn't yeah. grow up. With them. But uh, yeah, it, you know why? You know why? It wasn't me so much. It was people like Floyd Winter, Rich Australia, guys like that that just they saw some like crazy side of me that would keep going. We when I, I did it with one arm, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that. And they, they liked having me around because they knew when I was given a task, it was going to get accomplished. And I was a, a bit of a crusty master sergeant, a little old school. And I just knew how to get stuff done, you know, and keep people motivated. So I guess that's why they kept me around for a while. <laughs> yeah. So so talk a little bit about that. Talk about your start in in coming from you know uh, the military and moving into uh, wrestling for the uh, moving on to to being assistant coach there. Uh, I'll keep it as simple as I can because that's a, that's a big. That's a wide spectrum, you know. So sure, sure. I joined the military in August 1997. Um, I joined to do Air Force Security Forces. It was air base defense, ground combat stuff. Not not the law enforcement side was different. Um, I, I've told interviews before. Originally, I was in the Marine Corps Delayed Entry Program. A lot of trouble in high school. Ended up dropping out of high school, going to night school, getting my diploma at night school. But by then, the Marine Corps already dropped me from their program. The Air Force recruiter was actually the one that got me through into the night school program. And uh, so I kind of came back to her, and I was like, if you can get me out of here in two weeks with a job carrying a weapon, I'll do it. <laughs> and, and sure enough, you know, she actually pulled it off. I didn't think she could do it, but she did. And uh, since I said I'd do it, I went with it. Um, I did 20, 20 years active duty. I did uh, six deployments, you know, three trips to Afghanistan, another to Iraq, two more to Saudi Arabia. And then the part that gets overlooked a lot, which is probably worse than all of that, is the thousand days and nights in the missile field guarding ICBM weapons, just living out there for a thousand days. Um, away from your family, everybody for it's it's just never ends. It's a nonstop cycle. When you're home, you're training. You know, yeah. there's not really many days off or anything like that. It's very uptight. Um, so I got involved with jujitsu to keep it vague. You know, I started with I started kind of going down. There was a friend of mine training down in northern Colorado because we were around the border there in, in at FU Warren Air Force Base, which is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's the southeast corner of Wyoming. If you're not familiar with it, and right across the state mm -hmm. line is is Fort Collins. Kind of a party town with the Colorado State University being there. But the college was there and the campus was there. And a friend of mine, I was willing to do any workout you had out there. I'd try anything, whatever. <laughs> buddy that surprises me. I just can't believe I'm hearing that. 
We're here to try. <laughs> so a buddy of mine's like, come down and try this. This he was he was just calling a kickboxing, and we didn't know any different of what it was. We tired of kickboxing or that back then. And just like, okay, let's go, let's go get punched in the face and have a good time. And uh, so we went down. And I liked the work. I liked doing it. But on the other side of the gym, there was a guy running jujitsu classes, and uh, it wasn't terribly far apart. I mean, you're talking about maybe a hundred feet. You know, here's the mat sure. for that. Here's the space for this. You know, there's some there's a little bit of intermingling going on here and there once in a while. And one of the days, probably after a few months of being there, this guy named Jason Martinez comes up to me and goes, dude, he goes, you move pretty quick for a big guy. I said, well, yeah, I do a lot of football calisthenics, you know, stuff like that, the strength training, conditioning, I don't do bodybuilding, I don't do powerlifting, I focus more on speed, athletic performance type things. So I wanted to get out of the military eventually with those four years. I was working on my associates. I wanted to get to go to university and play football. Yeah. Um, and then I got married and other things happened, right? So mm-hmm. <laughs> the big guy had, had other plans. Uh, <laughs> I started with doing jiu-jitsu there. I stuck with jiu-jitsu, and I really enjoyed training jiu-jitsu there. It's 2003. is about the time I got my purple belt. Um, and then I changed stations to New Jersey. When I got to New Jersey, um, there was never really a gym I was terribly comfortable with, but I did get some good training, some good guys, some good schools. It wasn't the same atmosphere. I got spoiled out there in Colorado a little bit. Um, I did do an MMA fight, lost that, and then I'm sorry, I realized I need to learn how to wrestle. You know, because I actually – the guy, well, the guy I took on, the guy I took was nobody wanted him, and it was the main event fight down in Wildwood, New Jersey. And there's there's four thousand fans. I don't give a crap about that. But he was ranked. He was, he was tied with Jeff Monson and, and and grappling. And I'm like, well, let's just do it. So me not having the wrestling ability that I needed at that time, I had a decent jiu-jitsu game, but I wasn't able to score the takedown. I wasn't able to get the control I needed off the ground. The ability to move my hips and shoulders at the same time which you learn no better place than wrestling. You know, when you really start learning how to use your hips and shoulders simultaneously, you can get off your back against anybody. Um, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do that. But if I hadn't lost that fight, it's like I always tell anybody interviews me, if I hadn't lost that fight, we wouldn't be talking. We wouldn't uh, be talking yeah. today, yeah. you know. Um, so I went out and learned how to wrestle. I found the best wrestling coach I could. Um, the first guy, his name was Leroy. And Sean Dockerty can tell you some stories about Leroy. Because Leroy, I think he was a, I think he was a runner-up in the, the U.S. Open – and either I don't know, I don't know, it was freestyle or Greco in like the 50s or 60s. And this guy's like 60, 70 years old, and he would beat the piss out of you. And he's, he was at 170 pounds. I remember he put like saran wrap on his wrists. And I, I first I went to him. And I'm like, uh, is this safe? You know what I mean? He's like, I'm about 260, and he's 107. Super nice guy, but when he went live, oh my gosh, he'd club you and, and just wail on you. And it was, and I was like, all right, I mean, and we get into we get I get a little frustrated. We go after it after a while. I mean, I really enjoyed. He actually used to come to my he actually came to my my second MMA fight. Super nice guy. Um, but then I got I got pushed in a different. Right, he wanted me to go with the heavyweight heavyweight guy, whose uh-huh. name was Santos Caban, who runs a, a really good uh, Henzo Gracie school out of Lake Worth, Florida. I think it's just I think it's about thirty minutes north of uh, of Fort Lauderdale, right around uh-huh. that area there. His last yeah. time I saw him was Fort Lauderdale. I know he went a little bit north. Um. So that was my first learning wrestling. And he was he was a Division One All American out of Cleveland before that. And he was at least call he was just he can move like a cat. You know, he, he's a Puerto Rican guy, looked like he was Samoan. And if you know the guy, he's just freaking nature athlete, big monster guy. Um, nice, nice person, but we'd kill each other on the mats to the point where I started really getting to the point where I had to learn to survive, you know. But I, I like that. You know, I grew up like that with my brothers. So that's <laughs> all, all I ever knew was violent stuff. You know, everything since I've been born has been violence in some way or another, um, good and bad. But <laughs> so I've always been comfortable around that. But now I've been, a couple of years after that, I met Sean Doherty. He came along. I started learning catch and judo involved with the wrestling I was doing with Santos at the time. And I was stuck with that for a while. From there, I'm, trying, I'm not going to get too specific on the years because it's going to take sure. us forever if we, it's going to take us forever if we do it <laughs> um because there's a lot of things i know we want to talk about but sean he was in new jersey um his active duty and his wife and him he had they had a home in ohio that they owned so she's back there he's got he's got a handful of kids so yeah. she was running the home back there and he'd drive out on the weekend sometimes and stay at home there and then he'd train and stay with us during the week and i kind of I needed him the same way he needed me, you know, because I saw something crazy in him that I really <laughs> knew was different from all the other coaches around here. You're gonna, it's just no comparison, and especially then he was he was rough and tough. I mean, he had that. And that's the way I always tell people, 
you know, he he came up when Ken Shamrock was still the man, you know, when he was running the yeah. lines then. So when he got caught in a submission, there was no tapping. You know, you were, my knees got popped and blown. I don't know how many times. I was choked unconscious. I don't know how many times. And I was not a bad purple belt. But he could just <laughs> play with me. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I'd, I'd never been played with like that. Yeah. It, it was frustrating. But then my, when my wrestling kept coming up, my judo was getting better. And the catch stuff really started clicking with him, the way he yeah. was teaching it. And it was even it was funny as even making Santos change the way he was doing stuff with his amateur stuff. He's like, hmm. He goes, you know, I remember a guy showing it to me like that. But then I didn't have to do it like that because there's no submission threat. You know what I mean? In amateur wrestling. So uh, so eventually, so a few, a few, blah, 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 we go on and on and on. Uh, 2013 comes around. That was my first year on the Air Force wrestling team. Uh, in November 2012, I had knee surgery. Uh, January 2013, I had my bicep put back on. It was just ripped off. And my labrum and my collarbone, you can see it was cut open over here where they had to drop it in because it was just sticking up so bad. It was getting, my shoulder would pop out of socket all the time. Like It was like Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon, if you remember that. When he used yeah. to slam it. I never got into slamming it into objects, but it would just it would fall out sometimes. I just we had somebody pull on it, and we could usually get her back in place. But after <laughs> enough years, you're kind of like, because like, once you start getting all the surgeries, it gets, it's, I hate surgery recovery. I hate going to physical therapy dealing with all the nonsense. I hate it when they stick you in the corner with a rubber band and say, all right, keep doing this exercise for 45 minutes. We'll be back. And you're like, I can do all this crap at home. You know, yeah. I, especially if you're going to a personal trainer and a strength training coach, and I picked up on some of this stuff. And obviously, they knew more about me than ther about therapy, but I was able to kind of keep things going myself. But So here I am, completely out of shape, dude. And all my Army buddies start calling me, because I, I spent half my career attached to the Army guys and supervising them and stuff. They're like, like man, did, did you know... The Air Force wrestling team's on base. They got a couple heavyweights. He goes, but I'm telling you right now, you'll crush them. And uh, I'm like, what are you guys even talking about, first of all? Because the only Air Force wrestling team I know of is at the academy out in Colorado. I, didn't even, I had no idea. I had never been around or exposed to the fact that we had the all-forces teams. We had the all-Army team, the all-Navy team, the all-Marine team, the all-Air Force team, which do Greco and freestyle and they don't do the collegiate wrestling. You have these chances at the world team and sure. Olympic trials and things like that. It's very prestigious. The Army team pretty much is the Olympic team with a few of the national champions on the Marine team because they're wrestling year-round. They have the world-class athlete program. So they're very fortunate. Most of them, the guys like the Army team is out there at Fort Carson, training at the Olympic Training Center all the time, and the Marines are all over the place doing their thing. I know they got a good facility at, at Lejeune in North Carolina, which is where they do most of their training. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know how legit, you know, the the wrestling is from the U.S. military, but it's the world team essentially. Yeah, they, you know, I didn't. To be completely honest with you, um, now I won my spot that first year, and it, we, I duct taped my arm to my side, and the coach thought I was completely insane, but he was a little crazy too. Richard Strela was the coach, and he was the only <laughs> one. He's the only American coach I still believe to date to win a world championship in Greco for the United States. Um, so he had some world-class guys, you know, going yeah. in there. But he, he at least, he, I go in there with my sling on, Harry, and I got my, my, my master sergeant, I'm the old man. You know, there's <laughs> nobody in there above staff sergeant. And I walk in there with a sling on, and he's like, you're Sergeant Bain? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, uh, I guess you heard of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the they were using the Army combatives facility, so all the Army combative instructors that had known me for years, that I'd trained, I, and I'd roll with them every day, and we're, we did two-hour day, two, two days. Sean and I would train with the MACP guys for fun all the time, and then even coach them in competitions. They're good friends of ours. And uh, still to this day, a couple of them. But I was like, he goes, he goes, you really want to do this? He goes, he asked me to explain my surgery. I was like, yeah, it's, it's no big deal. I just... Uh, they're going to come check it out. And he was not one to sit there and say, hey, if he, he, let's just say he didn't try to stop me. So Fair enough. my idea, I'm, I'm pretty good at Jimmy rigging stuff around the house, you know, when I fix stuff. So I kind of do it to myself when I get injured, too. So I found some, some duct tape. <laughs> and it's, it's a true story. I, I duct taped my arm. I, it was my left arm. I duct taped it right around the bicep and tricep around my ribs. And that's how I, that's how I wrestled. Every single day, my arm was complaining. It was great because nobody could get an underhook on that side. <laughs> but that arm was just completely useless. And, and every time we would wrestle, I, I always felt like something was – I was always – I'd tell myself it was scar tissue. I kept telling, oh, it's just scar tissue. It's just scar tissue. But I wasn't sure. 
I'm picturing myself ripping my, all the surgeries apart yeah. this whole time because it hasn't even been, I mean, it was January and we're in there in February. So the guys that I'm talking to and getting to know on a team, you know, they're kind of hesitant because I'm outranking most of them. But then once they saw that I was kind of treated differently, we're, I was kind of looking at more of one of the guys type things and the stuff that we were doing. The workouts were, were tough. And like I said, it wasn't in great shape when I came in. I came, I rolled literally, you know, the movie The Fighter where Mark Wahlberg says, this guy just rolled off the couch. I literally <laughs> did roll off the couch and it was not in any kind of shape to go do this. So it was just like, oh my gosh, the worst timing possible. But I'm glad it happened. Uh, I ended up actually beating the other two heavyweights with that one arm, just working a lot of underhooks on that side, and I'd snap them back and do late inside leg trips and things like that. And then uh, I could usually beat him in the pummel. Because I was blessed with being around Santos. He was 320 pounds. The dude could move like a cat. And uh, I still had enough natural strength, and I understood leverage. And uh, I had been around Billy for a little bit, too, by then, and also learned some tricks from Billy. Billy was more of a refining process for me. Um, I wouldn't even call him my strongest lineage. I would say, you know, I have four catch pleasure lineages, and he was the one that really came in and took me those things that I knew and gave me some really cool old school stuff that I hadn't had the opportunity to see. Right. And then right. take the stuff that he saw that I understood and just refine the heck out of it to make it so much better and to really get me detail oriented the same way I was in my military career, but now infuse that into the way that I not only trained myself, but started coaching more at the time. Makes you know, because I never, I always wanted to be a student first. You know, I, I never want to be a guru or anything like that. I still go to classes and sit there and just sit there. And I get weird looks sometimes. I get it. But I think we've got to be a student first. You know, otherwise we stop growing. Um, so Rich takes me on the team. He won't let me wrestle in the Armed Forces Championship. He's like, I'm going to lose my job. If I let you actually wrestle in the Armed Forces Championship, I'm going to lose my job. But if you, if you place top two in the Armed Forces Wrestling Championship, you already qualify for the world team trials. Right. And that's just the arm. That's only the four branches. It's as high as you can pretty much go. It is one. Of, it is easily one of the top two or three most prestigious wrestling events in the country. Um, so it's, the competition is very, very stiff. So I was with Rich for two years, and then Floyd came in the third year, and I was, I was pretty banged up by then. I had a lot of injuries, you know, back problems. I, I tore my hamstring off one year completely. Both there's so you have four ligaments in the back of your hamstring. The reason I know this is because I actually don't want to operate. But uh, we, Floyd was doing a private lesson with me. And Rich was still the coach. So I was doing privates with Floyd the whole time. And uh, I, I, all I did was sprawl. And my, my workout buddy, he had a hold on the leg. And when I kicked my leg back, that hamstring, the two tendons right in the middle, just snapped and curled all the way up to my rear end. And they're still there. They, they just reattached. And, uh, and I'm like, I'm, at, I'm in such good shape here. I'm like, this is the year. I'm about 275. Oh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not like bodybuilder lean or anything. But strength's off the chart. Conditioning's off the chart. Nothing bad had happened yet. Yeah. I know I had those possibilities of disc slipping because they've done it so many times and stupid stuff always seems to happen like that but when that hamstring popped i was like i was pissed i was really pissed um but i didn't miss one practice probably the camp started not even three weeks later um there wasn't even much i could do about it i tried i put some ace bandage stuff around i'd ice it but every time it would try to reattach to the back of my leg i just keep going for every practice i was the team captain by then and i mm -hmm. wasn't about to sit on the side or miss practices and I'm already being yelled at by Rich telling me he needs a real heavyweight, so I need to eat more and get bigger and lift. And I'm like, I can't even – what do you want to do? You want to go squat 600 pounds right now? I can't even straighten my leg half the time. But I still wrestled every single match during practices, and we'd have five practices a day. You know, um, we'd have uh, – the guys – I wouldn't do – the heavyweights usually don't do the morning run too often, but everybody else goes out and runs in the morning <laughs> in the ice and snow. Because you're talking about New Jersey in, in February, which is probably our coldest month. So there's, there's ice on the ground, and, and 5 o'clock, the guys are out there. What I would do is go to the gym, and uh, I would do high-intensity interval stuff, either on the elliptical and switch back and forth on, the, on the, the treadmill when I could. But when my hamstring got torn up, I was basically rele relegated to the elliptical with high-intensity intervals, and then some, I'd do some weights. Yeah. The guys would come there, breakfast. Then you got your morning workout, which is about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Lunch, you're back at two o'clock or so for a couple hours, and it's usually light drilling about that time because you've already had a couple of hard sessions, and then you come back again at five, and you're there till about eight o'clock, you know. And then after that, the guys go to the light. I didn't have to because I was a heavyweight, but the light guys are going to the sauna, cutting weight, and it, it's a tough schedule to maintain. And you're doing this yeah. every single day, every day. The only day you don't do it is Sunday, and then if you don't, and you'll still get screamed and say you need to be doing active resting. Don't go lay on your couch. Don't go lay in the barracks. Because most of the guys come from other bases. They stay in the barracks on Fort Dix. 
and like get out and go for a walk, get out and go to the go down to the shop at or the commissary on base and walk around for a little while, something, do something. So I try to help encourage the guys to do that. So Rich was out after a while. That was a big old mess. But Floyd came in. And Floyd actually got Rich the job. And Floyd was still our team manager at the time. Now he'd won two national championships as a head coach. He was the first American to win gold in Greco Roman history as an individual for our country ever in nineteen seventy two. Um, he was a national champion in Greco, national champion at Sambo, on the World Cup team. It goes on and on. Plus, he was a two-time Olympic coach on the 84 and 88 Olympic teams. He was on the, he was on the coaching staff. So th- you're not going to get a better coach. And plus, I'd already been doing privates with Floyd for a few years now. So I'm starting to really pick this up. And I, to be honest, I never fell in love with it the way I did, you know, the catch, judo, and jiu-jitsu. <laughs> because I always wanted to finish. And right. it, it always felt so stupid. Just turning somebody, because I, I I could always turn everybody in the team easy, and but I'm 260, 270, you know. Even our best guys who were all Americans and national champions on the team, when I get on you, start breaking your shoulder down with a nasty gut wrench, you're gonna go over. But I would be a smaller heavyweight when I would go into those tournaments because those guys would cut down from 310, and then by the time guess what, when they're out to the mat again, it's like a lineman versus a linebacker, you yeah, know. Yeah. And that's not an excuse. My division, like I said, I had the number one, number two guys in the country for the United States in Greco. And it's the same two guys every single year, number one and number two in freestyle. You just flip flop the names. So the Marine was number one in the country for Greco every single year. And the army guy, Eric Nye was number two. And then you flipped them for Greco or for freestyle. So Eric would be number one. And it was funny because you see him every time and you're like, give me some new freaking guys to wrestle, man. Cause these guys are doing it all year, you know? Yeah. There? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. That for a while, uh, I probably shouldn't have done it the third year because I was having so many medical issues with my spine and, and everything like that. I, when I wrestled the last year with Rich, even Floyd told me I was insane because uh, I had bronchitis so bad. I had two herniated discs, which we found out later was radiculopathy, which means they were pinched too. And uh, Billy Robinson dies the day before the competition. Right, right. My daughter is back in New Jersey, and I got my ex-wife telling me that she's testing positive for, for uh, what was it, leukemia. Now, she didn't, that didn't come back again. It was a faulty blood test, but all this crap's on me, and I can't breathe. And, I, and Coach is like, you sure? You know, Floyd's talking to me. He's like, you sure you want to do this anymore? You don't have anything to prove. You know? And I'm like, we're doing it. You know, we're doing it no matter what. I don't care what happens. We came this far. Is it, you know, no matter who we got on the team, the first yeah, few yeah. couple, the very first few weeks on the team, no matter what, I was always able to be the best on the team, no matter what. But then, guess what? Old age starts setting in, and, and the way you push <laughs> my career field is a combat arms career field, and you get guys coming in from stuff that wasn't maybe so physical. Um, you got guys that were chefs or cooks in the military, but they were great. They, they came in to do that, but they were high level collegiate wrestlers and put in their because you don't just get you can't just show up, you have to be invited. So right, you, right. You have to be invited, and then you, you don't make the team until you win wrestle offs. You know, so there's a long process of cutting and cutting and cutting a team down. Um, it was a good time, man. The last year I did it, like I said, I probably shouldn't have been doing it, but I did. And I think Floyd asked me to come back and be assistant coach for, for another year or two. And, and I was so glad that he was still there. And I, I wasn't the best at saying no to him. He, <laughs> he's, just, he's just a good human being. He really is. So I came back. Um, you know, I'm a technique geek, you know, and I yes. really, I could literally, after being spending so much time with him, the way he would teach certain sequences, especially just his outside single sequence, I could probably say it. If you could play his voice and mine at the same time, we could probably say the exact same thing with two videos going at the same time. Because I've heard it so many times. I know where he's going. I know the next series. I know exactly what he's going to say, the words he's going to use, the keywords. Because everything he's saying had a, it was a purpose in every single thing he would say. He'd get me fired up so bad at practice. Because... He go, man. If we kids could have got Bane ten years ago, he'd be an Olympian, and I'd get pissed because he knows how competitive I am. And I'd be like, oh yeah, well you didn't get me ten years ago, and I'd never get mad at him. And he knew that. <laughs> now Rich, Rich and I would scream at each other and threaten each other in practice. It was bad. It was really bad. But I could never do that to Floyd. Floyd was like a father figure to me. You know what I mean? So yeah. I just kind of took it in stride. I, but I knew what he was doing. He was pushing my buttons, but he knew how to push your buttons. He knew how to make get you to go wild and just get after it. And he, but he could do it to anybody. He was kind of had that Vince Lombardi capability on the wrestling mat, you know, where he knew exactly what he needed. To, he didn't have to say it to you. He would walk past you about ten feet away to make sure it was loud enough that you heard it. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how he would hit me, and I'd be like, 
I know what you're doing, but now I'm pissed and I'd go after it no matter what was hurting. And I'd be, I'd be, you know, taking the crap out of everybody for the next couple of days and then sitting laying in the corner, you know, taking way too much Percocet. I was, you don't even want to know how much Percocet I was doing just so I could still move. <laughs> um, yeah, as a, as a friend of my team named Seb, and he ended up, we, he became a Greco national champion. Real nice. He, 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 he came in there. He's, I think he might be a year or two younger. He might be close to my age, but I know he, when he, when I left, he was the same rank as me. And he was the other team captain towards the end. So we had our old man corner, you know, basically sitting there with a whole lot of Percocet and pre-workouts and anything that could get the energy up and the pain down. That's what we were going to rely on to make sure we could give everything we had. And half the time we'd be beating the crap out of each other because he was only a couple weight classes below me. So I'm not sure how much good we were doing with that. Um, well, something that you said there uh, when you said that you got really interested in uh, the catch and the, the jujitsu and the judo because of the, you know, the, the finishing. And one of the things that, that, you know, I is very, it, it sort of sticks out and is, you know, it's obvious if you're paying attention about your personality is just that you live by the concept of no half measures and uh, you do everything, you know, like you, with, if you're going to do something, you're going to do it to the fullest of your ability. And uh, I think just what you said about, having that interest in the finish, it, it makes perfect sense and flows right with that concept of like, sure, you can, you can, you know, connect and control the guy and, you know, uh, and do whatever you want with him, but taking him all the way to the finish. I mean, that's, that's the no half measure, right? It really it weirded me out. And this goes right with what you're saying, because I can remember in, in those matches, like you gotta remember, you're going against the national champion in Greco and you just going through a three month camp and you're busted up. So you'll get tech fault in like mm -hmm. a minute. And you're like, in my head, coming from a grappling background, I'm like, you don't even feel like you, I mean, you, you know you lost, but you're like, I don't feel like I got my ass kicked. You know what I mean? I don't feel shit. <laughs> I don't feel like anything even happened. It was just like, and, I, and, I, and I'm not knocking amateur wrestling. I'm, I'm a big fan of it and an advocate of it, but I think the rules suck. I really do. I, th I like the, 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 the collegiate style positioning better than the stupid par tear bellying out international, ooh, you turned me over. Nobody cares. That's it. And I love, I, mean, I will support wrestling to the end, but it's like, I never understood. I, I like, I like the pinning concepts a lot better because I can use pinning and grappling to can make, create pain, force reactions, make people move. Like we talk about in catch. And I've said it a million times. If I want a shoulder lock, I'm going to pin the shoulders and push the head away. You know, if I mm -hmm. want a neck crank, I'm going to pin the shoulders and separate. I'm always looking to separate the head from the shoulders. And that's, that's easier to do when I have somebody pinned. Right. So sure. it, it works really well with catch. I'm not even talking about the 1905 old catches catch can rules. I'm not talking about that with a three man three pack count pin, because sure. we see less and less. There's hardly any shows anymore, unless we do it. To be honest, so and not even want to do that anymore, man. This the the style or the art. I always thought of it more of as an art because even Billy would say it wasn't so much a style but a set of concepts. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, but there were concepts you could apply to your judo and your jiu-jitsu. Catch wrestling made my judo better. Catch wrestling made my jiu-jitsu more effective. And I'm not just talking about submissions. I'm talking about just the basic mechanics and knowing how to really move your body and be explosive, no matter what your limitations are uh, athletically or whatever, because nothing is based on athleticism. It's pure technique. It's not like a wrestling move where Jordan, Jordan Burroughs has that great double leg Sure. And then here I go, where I can't even barely bend over to pick up a pencil right now. I'm not going to shoot like that. It's just not going to happen again in this lifetime. So, but I can get in and tie up. I guarantee, even my busted back right now, I can hold on a decent tie up for a little bit at least, you know. <laughs> and as we age, you know, we talk about it's the old rollers podcast, right? Yeah. As we age, you get in these kids' faces and you tie up with them. And I don't, I don't sit on collar and elbows. It's a lot more collegiate. I like getting on that Russian tie, wrist control, pummeling inside head position into arm drags. I'll do work. My, my biggest, I always say the big four that I do. Your arm drags your best friend, underhooks the king, Russian tie, and uh, did I say front headlock? It was the uh, that's the last one. Those are the yeah. four I rotate off of. And when I teach those guys those four, I show how they flow together. They flow together so you're going from, from literally from a tie-up to a tie-up to a tie-up to a tie-up instead of sitting and hanging on that collar and elbow all damn day. And, and I get it's the most common position to be in, and you, everybody gets there, you know? We got to learn how to get past it quick. All the wrestlers I train, we don't sit there. Uh, get past the stupid collar and elbow and let's move. Because it's a neutral tie-up. And, and something that you have been very vocal in, and my personal like jiu-jitsu journey and grappling journey is pretty young. 
Uh, I've only been uh, doing it for just about just a little under five years. Okay. But I got really lucky. A friend turned me on to your videos uh, pretty early. And one of the concepts that you reiterate and, and, and just always emphasize is that no, there's no such thing as a neutral tie that I'll tolerate. We're going to have two kinds of ties, and that's my tie or no tie. And you're looking from the beginning, from the connection on, to get an advantage and then continue to escalate that advantage. Right. And, uh, and I have taken that as part of my, you know, my grappling philosophy, too, and it's directly from you. Uh, and, you know, that's something that, like I said, you, you always emphasize, we're trying to beat champions. We're not trying to, you know, teach ourselves to whoop up on the white belts. Right. And so if you're going to beat champions, you got to have advantage. You can't, you can't come at it 50, 50. Yes, sir. Anytime you're in, like you just said, I mean, anytime you're in a 50, 50, any 50, 50, it's just a different way of saying it. It's the same exact word. It's basically a synonym. 50, 50 is a neutral position. Because if you and I are in, it doesn't matter what it is, I don't care if it's the legs or a collar and elbow, if we're both in the same position, neither of us are in a position to succeed. It's not our tie-up. It's not our position. It's not, you know what I mean? It's not yeah, mine. It's, it's not yours. We're scrambling for something. And that's why I always tell my guys, if you, if you do end up there, which does happen, it does. It absolutely happens. I just, I just don't understand the people starting there. I think we talked about why, why start somebody there. It's just stupid. Um because you're teaching them what? Everything's being, every single thing you say, everything they drill is being ingrained one way or another. Even if it's a mistake, they're learning it. You know, the muscle memory is happening whether you like it or not. And mistakes become part of muscle memory just as good as a good technique. It just sure. it doesn't change. And it's going to take you 5,000 times to fix that bad, bad technique, you know, instead of 500 good reps to get pretty good at it. And uh, it's, just, it's hard when you get certain students with wrestling backgrounds because you, you spend a lot of time undoing things. And uh, not always, not always, but we talk about 50 50. So when I coach guys, it's just like you said, I mean, I mean you said it just as well as I could ever say it. It's just, well, I'm just using your words. I'm not put yourself, to... if, if, but if I want to be in a position to succeed, why the hell would I give myself, give my opponent the same exact opportunity as me in any position anywhere in a match? I would never, I don't want to be there. Now, you're going to go through the transitions. There's always going to be transitions through those tie ups where there's going to be that little moment where it's neutral. We don't want to stay there. Get past the neutral position. Get past and fight past the neutral position and get to your tie. If you mm -hmm. get goofed up and end up in their tap, don't be scared to disengage. Don't settle for it because you're there in a position now. That it's not even neutral. It's their tie up, and we can't have that. That one doesn't even exist. I don't even talk about their tie up because as soon as you start hearing <laughs> their tie up, you're like, oh no, I'm in their tie up. No, it's your tie up or no tie up. That way, when you they that way, as soon as they not in their tie up or neutral, or that you know, if they don't have their tie up, I see them disengage immediately. Because they're not even thinking about, oh, I'm in, they're not thinking that. There's no, even those, that second of saying, oh, I'm in so and so's tap, you're already on the ground. You know, he's already got you wrapped up in that front headlock because you're sitting there thinking about, oh, no, coach said this is bad. But you drill it and drill it and drill it to, you know, when, when you can, when you I always say, when you can correct yourself on a technique, you know it. You know it. And now you just got to go drill it. And I said, yeah. when you're able to correct yourself and say, man, I messed up. I, 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 my, my hand goes here, it doesn't go there. Crap. When you can say that, you know the technique, right? And that's when the drilling comes in. And I've never believed ever. And I'm not even sure how that got pounded in my head. I think it was a combination of Floyd and Billy, honestly, it was just why on earth would you want to be in a position to allow someone to beat you? Because mm -hmm. you're not wrestling bums. And I learned that the hard way on wrestling the armed forces team. They are the best in the world. And they will run straight through you in a second if you try to sit there in a neutral anything. Because mm -hmm. they're moving before their brain even thinks about it. Because they're drilling 365 days a year. You know? So how in the world are you going to beat a high-level guy one day? Even if you never want to go to the ABCCs or go to a high-level, these all these big pro tournaments now. Or if you never want to do that, why not still have that mindset of a champion and hold yourself to the same standard? You know? That's and, and how this relates... In a, in a lot of ways to, you know, like my fellow old rollers is that we're on the mats. I, I can't control who's on the mat. I can't control if it's, you know, a 22 year old kid who, you know, just finished, uh, you know, NCAA wrestling division one. I. I can't control if it's a 25 year old, uh, you know, cop who's 240 pounds and, you know, just all beef. You know, I, I don't get control of those things, but I can control the ties that I will tolerate. And if I am tolerant of, you know, my opponent's tie and they have a physical advantage over me, 
well, now I got two things stacked against me. So, you know, I got that inner Joel Bain in my head saying my tie or no tie. And if you try and, you know, catch on to me in a way that's, that's, I'm already at a disadvantage, you know, I can't allow that. My brain can't tolerate that. Uh, and that's that has voice. it worked for you? Has it been beneficial? Absolutely. That's, you know, I, to, and to be perfectly honest, as we have, you know, done a lot of these interviews, uh, the purpose of this podcast is very, very selfish, and I make no bones about it. I want to listen to and learn from experts and people who can help me to, and, and you know, my listeners, because I'm sharing this, to uh, explore, you know, grappling technique and longevity in a way that keeps us dangerous and gives us the most amount of time on the mat over time so that we can be the most dangerous. We don't want to roll into our 65th birthday being a guy that people are like, yeah, you know, he knows some technique or he could flow roll or whatever. Like, I, I want to be a dangerous ass old roller that yeah. the last round when the bell goes off and we're switching partners, the 25 year old looks at me and he's like trying to avoid eye contact because he knows he's going to have to, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. And, and so like, like I said, the, that Joel Bain, my tie or no tie concept has been one that has helped me to even the odds, so to speak against my young roller, you know, partners. And so I wanted to come straight to the source on that. Yeah. And, you know, get, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh no, you, you weren't interrupting. I, I was merely, you know, stating that I think it's important that we share that, you know, especially there's a perception and it's a, there's a perception of catch wrestling that it's almost like all scrambling and athleticism and just like going after stuff. And I think it's a, I think it's a false perception because what I have learned, uh, you know, from, from you, from other people who have taught me things, you know, like, uh, coming from Billy Robinson, uh, is that technique is always emphasized because we always assume we want to be in great condition. We want to be strong. We want to be fast. We want to be as athletic as we can. But we're going to assume that our opponent is too. So then if you take two equal athletes, technique is what's going to be the difference. You know, right. if, if, you, if I'm more efficient than you and I'm more effective and we're the same athlete, then I'm going to be the one that wins. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're 100% right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, even as we're get, getting older, um, one thing I'll say about that, there was a message that just responded to a little bit ago. Um, I got a lot of questions and it was funny because i guess i i guess I, I thought on it more what you're asking me about how do i you know we're, we're getting in our 40s and stuff and and it, we all have different mileage first of all i'm mm -hmm. I, I can tell you right now i'm not gonna be able to do this anymore if, if the lord lets me live to 65 i can't do this anymore there's no there's no <laughs> chance i'm i think i'm almost at the end right now and, I, and I, it breaks my heart but that's just the i just never took good care of myself man I, i've torn so many things ripped so many things apart and it's just a, it's it's a disaster, and I'll feel sorry for myself one bit. I wouldn't change anything, and I'm always going to try and give everything I can. But we all have different mileage, and I think it's the first thing we have to recognize within ourselves. Okay, it's just knowing your limitations. It doesn't mean you can't still be a badass. I don't care how old you are. Crap, even mm -hmm. Billy with his cane was still a badass. When he grabbed you with that big meat hook of his, you were like, <laughs> I don't think I could break this man's grip. I, I, I can only imagine what it was like, you know, when he was like winning the, the, the European champions in like the mid-50s. If he got a good wrist, just grabbing a wrist control on you. Mm -hmm. his, his, his hands were like, if you ever look at the videos, his hands were very thick. He, had, he basically didn't even have a wrist. I mean, you hear about people with cankles. His forearm went straight into his hand. You know, it was a very powerfully built man. Um, and he was never a big weightlifter guy. He believed in a lot of calisthenics and things like that. But right. uh, he always believed that wrestling was the best place to get the strength from, you know, and doing that stuff like that. I'm not saying don't lift weights because I lift weights, you know, as best I can. But there's, I think there's a ratio that you have to find for yourself. And, mm -hmm. and I thought about this when I was answering a, a gentleman today on, a, I don't know if it was a YouTube. I'm trying really hard to answer YouTube more because I didn't do it for years. Because I used to have somebody else do it for me. And I'm like, all right, now I don't, what else am I doing right now? <laughs> trying, to, trying to get more involved with everybody and be as helpful as I can. And because, uh, gosh, we're all in a crappy situation right now. I think it's a bunch of bullshit, but. Uh, we are where we are right now, and if I can make somebody a little bit happier to help, you know, oh, cool, that makes sense now. I get it. You know, just a little yep. second. That means something to me. So, anyways, I was kind of breaking it now. We're staying kind of big. The guy goes, I'm 42 years old. 
he goes, uh, but he hadn't even really started training. You've already got five years on, on this cat, which is which is a good level of experience. But he was saying, if I, if I start this now, I bike, I swim, I do all these things. I'm in pretty good shape for my age. You know, I said, well, there you said it. You know how to keep yourself in shape, which is the, probably the most important thing right there, because conditioning mm-hmm. is the heart of all of it. Um, if you know how to do that, and if you're do, if you doing all those physical things and keeping yourself pretty injury-free, you can probably do this if – you say, okay, there's got to be a breakdown of ratio. And, and you don't need to roll as much as you think you do, first of all. And Anthony Argyros was the one that really got me thinking that. Because I used mm-hmm. to believe for years I wanted two-a-days. I wanted three-a-days. I wanted to be on the mat every single day. I would take my my youngest daughter back in, gosh, right after she was born, 2009, 2010, into the old wrestling room down in Pensacola near Philadelphia and take her in there in her baby carrier and set her down the side, and I'd stay right in that area, of course. But I was not missing anything. If there was something going on, I had to be on the mat. And there's my notebooks. Here's everything I need. I'd have her baby formulas and whatever she needed and diapers. And nobody gave a crap because everybody knew me. They knew I was going to do it. Yep. So, it, you know, I, I wasn't going to miss it. I wasn't going to miss anything. And I think that's one of the reasons, guess what, more wear and tear. It was more wear and tear because it was always 100 miles per hour. Like, you, I, I don't know how to go. I don't know how to go half speed on a lot of stuff. Now, we can roll and have a good 50-50 roll, but as far as if I'm pushing myself to get somewhere or to be successful with something, I feel like if I'm not giving it an all-out, like on the verge of puking effort with every single thing I'm doing, even as that would pertain to building snake pit, obviously you're not going to puke, but pushing yourself so hard to the point where you feel like you've always put too much on your plate, but guess what? I can put a little more and I'm going to keep going because as soon as I stop moving, somebody's out working me. And I'll never yeah. be the best. It'll never be the best. It's not just about me. I know I just said I. The program should be the best the way that the, the work ethic behind it has always been there. And it's the proof is in the pudding. Look at what our schools have done. We've had over 60 schools. We've had guys all the way into the ADCCs. Even Anthony Argyros has been in the ADCC and done well and submitted guys. We've had guys, I don't want I don't even, NAG is not a big thing, but it's a decent, respectable show. It's a, it's a good sized performance. Our guys going in a clean house, even the headquarters are walk out there like 10 belts every time. It's in, And they're, they're wearing Snake Pit USA gear, you know. Our guys do very well. So when people say there's no catch wrestling guys in competition, I don't know what shows they're going to, but I need to look again. And we, we can talk about that more later with how I feel about the, the rules and stuff. There's there's more catch on people are doing than anything else right now. Yeah, they just don't understand it because their coach doesn't understand it. Um, well, you know, that kind of that kind of dovetails to something that I think is important. And we talked about this in the previous one with uh, where the, you know, before the audio uh, went to garbage. And that is that um, uh, one one thing that I think demonstrates the efficiency of catch wrestling is just kind of as a in a, in a microcosm is the toehold, uh, because in jujitsu, a lot of the times the way it's taught is this kind of like you connect your figure four grip to the foot and then you push the guy's foot toward his butt and it's your triceps and it's your pecs and it's you know like a pair of fairly small muscles against the large muscles of the leg and the way that it has been shown to me you know from uh billy robinson from a couple of different people uh yourself included uh just basically flies in the face of that you're connecting the the foot to your your body uh, and, and when you set that figure four in, you're bringing it to you. And then instead of pushing it away, you're driving it away with your hips and with your, your abdominal muscles and your, the, the intercostal muscles between the ribs. It's a full body motion through the cutting bone and this tiny, uh, that, you know, that's set right at the, the, uh, Achilles. And so it's, it's a whole body against a really tiny little joint. And suddenly that goes from a throwaway you know, kind of garbage submission to very, very efficient. Uh, because if I put my whole body against, you know, a small joint of anybody, I don't care how strong they are, I got a good chance of breaking that. Yeah, it's funny. and we, we always hear different things from different places, right? I've actually never heard anybody say that before about a toehold, but I'm not surprised people are saying it because most people don't know how to do it, and you were blessed to learn how to do it the right way. Um, most people don't know how to do a heel hook the right way because if you got a guy rolling, you're not controlling his ball joint. You know what I mean? He's already out, probably, unless you're lucky enough where you're athletic enough to use strength and power. Because people try to hook it down here. It actually goes up mm-hmm. here. They don't understand that. It should take less than a quarter inch. You know, even my jiu-jitsu coach, he'll, he'll, do, he'll teach the heel hooks the way I do it now. And he was already really good with them. He was really sharp at that. But when we go back to the toehold or any submission, I want to 
connect my body and lock onto it basically like an anaconda so that my whole body is doing the submission. Nothing is just my arms versus your arms. You know, like as I say, I'm not, even with just a toehold, when we do BJJ, you know, you know, obviously, you know, I, you know, I still do BJJ. I'm a second degree jujitsu black belt, so I, I, I love jujitsu, but I don't do the submissions the way that I was before Carlos, who, who does. He's, I just tell him, I, I, I tease him because I tell him he's doing catching the gi. He's still neck cranking the freaking gi. He doesn't care. He comes from a really rough lineage, and that's the reason. That's why. That's why I went to him, right? But um, when you grab that toehold. A lot of guys go like this, and they do that thumbless grip, right? And why do people do a thumbless grip? Because they're scared of the gi. They get thumb getting caught. Okay? And we're talking about no gi right now or catch, really, right? So why on earth would I still use that grip when I can get this, and now I can actually squeeze and twist? Because before anything happens, once you have it locked into your chest like this, once everything's here and it's a part of me, this gets twisted down, and I rotate my shoulders first before I do mm -hmm. any crunching. Then I twist my body up out so that the heel actually goes outside their hip. Once the heel, I mean, if you think about somebody, just imagine them kind of on their side, you've got the toe hold, whether it's a classic catch reap or one of these ashy, stupid garami positions, it's all the same crap. It's, it's just, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, that, one, that one drives me insane. It's just, it's, re, it's relabeling crap and selling it for something. It's the same old shit we've been doing for hundreds of years. But um, when you get there and you, you want to, every submission, you should be strangling in the submission itself. And you have to compromise your opponent first. But for me, I can kind of, the fastest way for me to compromise you is to get my body locked completely on to what I want. If I'm on top, I want all my weight over top of where the submission is going to be. You know, that way I'm using my body weight and leverage against it too before I even start moving to take out the slack. Now I'm going to take out every single centimeter and start strangling the toe hold like I'm doing a, you know, a stranglehold or a rear naked. It doesn't matter. I, was, I squeeze all my submissions exactly the same. Now, every submission has an extension, right? And obviously, the extensions are differently. But before I extend any submission, I will strangle the submission because I want a one-inch concept. If I know, if I've taken all that slack out, if I look around, I mean, think about when you do a triangle choke and the guy hooks on the ankle down here, right? So here's the trap leg and here's the hook leg. They hook on the ankle yeah. and there's this big hole. See my head? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, now I need to turn and look in the ear and that shouldn't be on the ankle in the first place. I should be on the shin, Right here and then i should be pulling this knee in so it goes here so my knees are getting squeezed together then when i arch up and pull i squeeze my knees together even further so every submission has that window doesn't matter if it's a side choke doesn't matter if it's a top wrist lock double wrist lock doesn't matter it has that window so this goes it, it is, I'm, I'm trying to stand point with the toe hold but this goes across it's just con conceptual so it means it goes across everything right yeah, yeah. here's the here's the, the the slack and this is during the transition Connecting it to your body, you're taking that hole every single centimeter away where the guy is tapping before you're even done. And you know when people are tapping like that in sport, then you can break it real fast and easy when you need to. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you, God forbid, you had to do it in a different format. So that's the way I teach submissions. And, and even when I sit there, it's all perishable knowledge. You know, I try to hold myself to the same standard, too. And I'm drilling. I'm like, you know what? I need to do that again. That was not tight enough. I'll say it at seminars. I have no problems. I'll be the. I'll be like, no, no, no. But back up a little bit. Hold on, and I'll be like, okay. This is why I didn't do it with the heel hook because I'll pull the heel hook in like a Heisman Trophy. I hook it right here on the Achilles, okay, and I pull it into my armpit with the cutting bone up. No gable grip. No butter. I don't know what the crap this. I've seen all these butterfly grips and all this extra stuff. And actually, one of them does work with the power. There is a power heel hook. You can use that. Something I just saw. I think it was one. Uh, Craig Jones just used. He had a power. A power yes, yes. grip. And I, well, Eric Paulson like was a big promoter of that. Eric Paulson was one of the ones that showed me that. I was, I was a CSW coach for a while. And uh, he was a big fan of the power heel hook. So that was totally, it was on point. That's, which is why it worked against Vinny Magalares, who's like Mr. Rubberman, right? Breaks his leg and didn't even tap, I don't think, but lost. But I think he verbal tapped, maybe. I don't know. But Yeah, I think the ref stopped it. It was, so if it you was, listen to the audio, it sounded like somebody tearing apart like a, like a head of lettuce. I mean, it was just the most terrible sound. It's always a nasty pop, and it's hard, it's hard to tell where it's coming from sometimes because it's usually the knee, but sometimes the foot dislocates, and that's just as loud as the knee sometimes. I've, I've had my own foot dislocated in competition, and uh, it was quite loud, and I was okay. I, I got and walked off, and actually one of my buddies was a chiropractor, popped it right back in, and we were good to go for the day. But the efficiency you're talking about 
is not just aging and things like that. It's the efficiency and the technique, and like you said, it's the catch wrestling. The catch wrestling still has that highly detailed. I mean, if you're going to the right sources, it, you should you should be getting that detail, detail, detail because it's not. It's growing bigger more than ever, more than ever, especially right now with everybody at home they're buying DVDs. So <laughs> they're watching it, they're figuring like, whoa, this is cool. You get so many messages, man. If I had knew this existed, I would have done this first. And you're like, well, probably not a school in your area, unfortunately, which is why we started Snake Bay USA mm -hmm. um, to get people the material. Now we expect our students to still train at a good jujitsu or judo or wrestling based school that goes in there and says, okay, just make sure they got a good no gi program that's wrestling based with a credible jujitsu coach who's not going to be so political or so against anything that you're doing. You know, I can't stand when people say, oh, don't you can't do this because you're wearing a gi. I'm not gonna curse. <laughs> if I'm a second degree black belt, that means I'm a professor in the IBJJF. And a purple belt will try to walk out and be like, Professor, you, you can't do that submission in the gi, you're not allowed. And then I will light them up because that's the old master sergeant comes out. I'm like, have you lost your freaking mind? First of all, are we in the middle of an IBJJF tournament? No. Second of all, I don't give a crap what you're wearing. It's not changing my game plan. There's the way I do things, and I don't care what we're wearing. I hand fight the same way. It makes it very hard for people to get grips on me, whether wearing a gi or not. Hand fight, hand fight, hand fight. That's why all my guys in the older days when we started when I started coaching, we did so much hand fighting and, and, and grip work stuff. They would go into the tournaments and without even training jujitsu, and they'd do better. I get pissed at them because they would they, most of them would win their no gi divisions and then do even better in the gi divisions as white belts going into blue belt divisions, and, and the guys wouldn't even score one point on them. And they go through them in 10 seconds. And I'm like, maybe we're I don't know if we're doing something right or wrong, but <laughs> It's kind of, you know, it's the hand fighting, hand fighting, hand fighting stuff, right? So my point is, it shouldn't matter what you're wearing. For those of you who are listening right now, it's, if you're not competing in IBJJF, now if you guys are white belts, blue belts, you got to abide by your instructor's rules, purple belts, doesn't matter, you abide by your instructor's rules. But where I'm at, I'm, I'm nine times out of ten the coach, you know? And to me, a submission is a submission. And it goes to a coach to student ratio as well, where you have, if you have enough coaches on the ground with enough students, it equals out maybe a one to five, one to six ratio students to coach. There's no submission that's too dangerous to teach. There's no submission. I've been neck cranked more than any human alive. It has nothing to do with my neck problems. I've told you of having times my knee pop, knees have been popped, and I've only had to have surgery a couple times. Now I'm supposed to have reconstructive surgery, but I still don't think it was from the heel hooks. I think it was doing ruck marches with 100 pound rucksacks on my back and going out of helicopters. That did yep. a lot more damage than me getting heel hooked, I promise you. Um, but a submission is a submission, man. And we got to be as efficient as we can. Take out every single centimeter. No slack on anything. Stay small. Even guys, on, uh, when they do leg locks, they overextend themselves so far, I notice. I want to be in a ball. Super tight. With my, like, a, like I talked about that anaconda locked onto that leg as I run and control that ball joint the same way I would uh, that shoulder joint, the ball joint here, right? If I'm doing, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's a double wrist lock, top wrist lock. doesn't matter. if I don't care if it's an arm bar. As soon as I squeeze my knees on somebody's arm, the shoulder goes up like this. And watch it next time. And you guys listen. Next time when you're rolling, you're, you're drilling your arm bars, pull your legs in like you're supposed to do your leg curl and squeeze your knees together like you're trying to pinch. You know, I always make I do the the, what, the Sally, what was it, Suzanne Summers. <laughs> Suzanne Summers. No, nobody younger than us is going to understand what I'm talking about. Well, the old rollers know about together. it. And now and what happens is that ball joint does what? It goes like this. And I can feel right now, as crappy as my shoulders are, I feel it on my elbow right now, and there's nobody on there arm barring me. Because now everything below that ball joint is twice as vulnerable because you've completely taken that ball joint, which holds it, and locked it down. And a lot of guys are missing that right now on leg locks, I think. And I think, you know, they're, and these guys are great, and they're winning. So, I mean, who am I to say it, I guess? But I've, no, I've never had people roll out of my leg locks before. It's, if people are rolling, you, you goofed up. You don't have control of the ball joint. If the ball joint is locked, it is impossible to roll. You can't. It's sealed. It's like trying to bridge out an arm bar. If that ball joint, that shoulder's rammed up in the air, and you've got the proper, whether it's a palm, bending on the arm bar, whether it's a Japanese arm bar, whether it's palm down or thumb, or whatever you have to do, it's bending on the arm bar, because they are different. If you have that ball joint controlled appropriately or, or correctly, there should be no, it's done. You should already it's, be thinking yeah. about when you're taking your buddies to dinner after the fight. That's how, that's how secure you should be in your submission knowledge and, and, and whether you have it or not. And uh, some of these guys, you know, we have that hooking mentality too where we don't want to kill each other, but at the same time, we want to make sure, hey, if I, if, I, if I get it, you better be ready to, you know, tap. So what I do with my guys, I'll hold it with one hand and pull it. 
and I can usually get him to tap with one hand because I'll, I'll use the other hand to pull my legs together. Well, I'll grab the tendon in my thigh and actually pull my leg down and just pull my arm back in my armpit, literally pulling my thumb like this back with the heel, right? So it's sitting here, not down on here on fat and muscle, fat and muscle moves, right? You get <laughs> the gi sometimes, they don't want you to do it in the gi, but down here, this is, it's like a sniper. A sniper takes his rifle, and I've been to sharpshooter training and high all these marksmanship schools. It's never hard on hard, because what does your elbow do when you're trying to shoot? We're all over the place. Soft on soft gives you the same crap. You just mush. But if you can go hard on soft, it locks. So think about that Achilles as kind of being the soft, and that little groove right there, because there's a bone right underneath there. That's your heart. And it locks and seals that heel like no other place on there. Does that make sense? It does. I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent on heel hooks, but hopefully it'll help well, some with the efficiency thing that we're talking about. We want that one inch, one inch submission concept. Yeah, when you started, when you're talking about that, if if we load up all of our body against a small joint, and then we have a large amount of potential motion because we started really balled up, then and it only is going to take an inch to break, but we got say 12 or 15 inches worth of motion. We start talking about, you know, uh, efficiency and uh, the thing that, that we have as old rollers is patience, uh, you know, like maybe some wisdom, maybe some experience. And when when someone is young, they might be more willing to, you know, just try and scramble and, you know, maybe half ass something and just catch it. Whereas now, like the hope is that, you know, we as old rollers, uh appreciate more the beauty in that catch you know like the the art of it which is to make it where the other person really has no option but to tap they didn't tap because i wrenched on it they tapped because they had no other choice i didn't even have to move they knew yeah. it was like okay it's over it's like sealing the trap door you know yeah that's that's not a billy thing you would always see about the three doors you know you have three doors closed two of them leave one of them open you already know where they're going when they go through the door slam it shut on them um the human human body can only react so many ways so it's people always say, well, you, you got to get more mad time, more mad time to get two and three steps ahead of. Well, it's hard to get three steps ahead, but to get one or two moves ahead of your opponent or even your your partners, like, oh, you got to be on the mats so many years. Well, yeah, you got to be on the mats drilling, but you need to be memorizing and thinking about the human body and how it bends and moves and things like that. What Paulson used to say that the body is a submission waiting to happen, right, Eric Paulson? Um, mm -hmm. And he's he's right. He's absolutely right. But you have to memorize every possible reaction because it might not give you a submission immediately. But it, you got to know where they're going. And I always tell my guys, use your opponent's movements and reactions to either sustain or improve your positioning. Don't just go with the flow. I can't stand guys that just are so quick to flop to their butts because they're kind of losing the take now, but they haven't lost it yet. They just give up and because they're, they're so <laughs> used to hearing their coaches say that stupid shit. Sorry. <laughs> So I've coached at probably at least 200 and some grappling tournaments in the corners, and I'm sure these coaches are really good in their gyms. I'm not disrespecting them personally, but this is the when they say this, I, I kind of look at them like, you are an idiot. Because they tell teach these guys, and I'm, remember, I'm coming back from somebody who's done convoys and stuff like that. If I got ambushed, okay, first of all, if I'm on my back with somebody over me, I'm not in a good place. I'm not going to go, okay, Joel, take it easy, man. Everything's okay. Just breathe. No. <laughs> So I teach a concept with my guys because you'll hear, like, most of my guys will get the takedown because we do so much takedowns. And, and not always, but most of the time because it's, it's a heavy part of what we do. I, I, I got a judo black belt. I wrestle. We, we do takedowns. And when we start jiu-jitsu class, guess what? We start with judo. Yeah. It's part of BJJ. <laughs> it's part of it. It's where jiu-jitsu really comes from is Kano jiu-jitsu and judo and then a nice influence from catch wrestling. Um, so we start with takedowns. Everything starts with takedowns. You're not miracling it to the ground. Okay, you're not going to butt scoot across the parking lot after me because I took your parking space. It's not going to work. Okay, it's stupid. So, although I, I might, I, I might actually I do that, that Joel. Like huh? if, if if you and I got into a conflict over a parking space, I might butt scoot behind you just to see if I could just make you think I was weird enough to run away. Just visualize <laughs> it though. This is, like this guy's like threatening you, and then he drops his butt, and you're like. Uh, are you serious? All right, man. I'm gonna go inside now because this is just getting so embarrassingly stupid. You know, it's like, are you? And I can imagine they get into the door, knocking on your door with their toe, right? Uh, it's just, anyways. So you see, you see this a lot too in in uh, uh, the UFC and Bellator. Um, guys, guys who get taken down, 
but they don't accept the takedown even at that point. They're, they're moving and scrambling and using the momentum off the mat to bounce back up and, and then, you know, get to the cage. Maybe they're going to cage fight some, or they might just scramble away and, and break the tie up, you know, like they got taken down, but they did not accept it. They used the momentum of that takedown to fight to a better position from the, from the moment they hit the mat, they were fighting off the mat. Absolutely. I don't believe the takedown is over until all scrambling is completely ceased. There's usually a point at some point where there's a deep breath from one of them. One of the one of the one of you, whether it's it could be either guy, where you'll see it kind of slow and it's just a second, but you'll see it, and that's when you know that little bit of action has stopped and now it's going to something else. You mm-hmm. know, that's when you know the takedown. There's plenty of times where I've had it's some I'll have my guys start a takedown on me, and I'll completely reverse them in the middle of the air and land on me, and they they, they start getting pissed. They're like, damn it, coach, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but I'm and I but I want them to come out if they hit me with it right, I'll usually go down and then I'll fight off my back because I'll do it anyways. But if they come in a little sloppy and do something, I'll change it to something else and throw them instead. But I tell them, you got to be confident off of your back, not comfortable on your back. There's a big difference. When you're confident off your back, you can believe that you can finish anybody first, but you also believe that you can wrestle off your back. And for some reason, we go to jiu-jitsu, and, this, and I'm speaking this as a jiu-jitsu guy, some reason <laughs> we go to jiu-jitsu and tell people, hey, how do I get off my back? Well, who are the people in the whole entire world that are the most scared to be stuck on their back? wrestlers exactly so why wouldn't i want to take a guy who knows i mean even if i can't find a catch guy show me how to get out of a head and arm show me how to get out of somebody who's pinning me this way show me how to get us how would you do it show me how to bridge properly you know i'm not telling you don't shrimp i'm not telling you not to regard those are things i'm a hybrid when i roll i do all kinds of different stuff i mix things together whatever mood i'm in i'll mix things together but i'm not i want to go to the best source for everything you know, I, I usually, I, I'm very, two things guys have always come to me for the years is getting off the back because I know I, I really focus on rotating the hips and the shoulders. And jiu-jitsu teaches the same thing when you pop to your side to shrimp, but it's very difficult to do when you have a heavy weight across your shoulders because what will happen is your hips twist and nothing else happens, right? Right. <laughs> so Billy would teach that punch out where your fist is here. And eventually, you won't even have to punch once you get good enough at it. And, and everybody's so scared to roll away from the guy, Right. Because he'll take your back. There's a time, even with the gi, there is a second in there you can do. I do it all the time. I have never been choked from the back. And I've been choked just like everybody else, but not from that technique. Not one time. And I've learned that over a decade ago. And they know I'm going to do it. But they don't drag their head out either. There's a little trick. You may have seen the DVDs I do. If you ever watch Wicked Transitions is out there. It's a free DVD on YouTube right now. Okay, that's normally a $50 DVD that we sell. I put it up there for free because we're all stuck at home. It's the fundamentals really of catch. Because everybody thinks that they know, I know how to sit out, these high school hairy sit outs and crap, they're going to get you crucifixed or put in a stupid choke holder, pinned in a, you know, a way that you may not have ever seen before that comes from catch. So we try to put all that stuff in there. And a lot of that was Billy's stuff. It's a very special DVD. That's kind of why I wanted to put it out there for everybody. But uh, what was yeah, I saying? Actually, about the... I watched it. It was awesome. Uh, Did you like and, it? Uh, yeah, I keep going back to it. Um, Good. Because we watch it as much as you can. I'm, I'm going to keep it up for a while. Um, I had Hooker one up for a while, but that's a skill level DVD, and it's a higher skill level DVD where it's a little more advanced. Now, I don't think there's any techniques more special than another technique, but the guys, I'd rather, I'd rather that fundamental technique thing be have the, something that's representing us first. I'd rather have that fundamental DVD be, we talk about legacy type stuff, that's more important. Any a-hole can do a submission, you know, um, and there's millions of places to pick it up. Once you understand the concepts that we teach about the submission, you can learn a submission from anybody and take those same concepts that we were just talking about. You could you could go learn a, a totally different submission that maybe you've never seen me do from one, from your jiu jitsu coach, and then maybe take those catch concepts that you heard me talk about, and now look what you got. It's not it's not new. You just took out the slack and used those old school concepts and injected it into your your style, who you are. Your the, who, everybody's their own fighter. You know, we, we, Sean and I say this all the time, and and, and actually the other you know, guy's strong style was with Sean doing it. Of the he said the same thing too. Pablo, he's saying uh. Nobody wants to build a, a clone as a student. You know, you want to show them here. I always tell my guys, here's your tool bag. You go to a, you go to a seminar, you got your tool bag, and maybe you take two techniques from this guy and two techniques from that guy and throw out something that you just you don't need no more because, man, you like this so much better and you really believe in this move. But you always have your tool bag. That's your tool bag. It's only yours. Nobody else is going to be like yours. It's not going to look the same. It's not going to feel the same. It's not going to perform the same. It's completely different. That's your game. That's your game that you're building right there. 
is what that is. And we're all different. I don't want to clone. So when I, when I talk about concepts, I think it's the most important way to build somebody like that. When we understand those concepts, which if, if you watch at the beginning of Wicked Transitions, all it does is me talk. And this was, I filmed that in what, 2015 or 2016? My wife's here hanging out making sure I don't get too excited. You get <laughs> hey, me going. Tell, if she hears me, tell him to get way excited. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> She's going to go get my two in the back of a pre workout. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do you remember when we used to have uh, remember when we used to have jacked uh, like and in the hillbillies we called it jack 3D because we didn't realize that the 3 was supposed to be an E but, oh man I took that shit one time before before a squat workout and I almost like blew my butthole out like I was just like I can never ever do this again sorry I didn't mean to just go the That's wrong it. way but when you, when you mentioned pre-workout like that I had to throw that story in there don't do pre-workout if you're anything like me. I'm way too sensitive to caffeine, and uh, yeah. whew, it got bad. I used use the old old ones because I, I had heart problems a little while back, a couple of years. I'm, I'm doing pretty good now with it, but uh, I'll get like a, a tachycardia thing going on where it's kind of it starts sending wrong, wrong signals. It's in my yeah. family yep. where uh, if I get too much caffeine in there, I'll be like, "All right, guys, I need a minute." You know, I used to be able to <laughs> I used to take a medicine for it all the time, and I'd, once I got away from a lot of the caffeine for about a year. It died down. So hopefully, you know, because they were they were supposed to go in and burn me. They went through my legs. They went through my arms to go in there and try to get it to react. And it, yeah. just, it just wouldn't react. They couldn't. They couldn't get that tickle to get it to do it. So I just got stuck with it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I used the, not, old, the old pre workouts. Like they're, they're probably like crap to everybody else because there's like five models later. You know, right, this is like no caffeine. It, what, like a hundred milligrams probably compared to like these crazy ones now that Lord only really knows what they got in them. Man, I think Jack had some kind of like uh, Chinese meth in it or something, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you keep talking I mean, about it, you're gonna sell me on it. <laughs> I, I was I was seeing shit like my eyes started twitching. Like you were talking about like tachycardia, like everything was twitching in me. I was like, God damn, I'm oh in a fight. <laughs> dude, I don't think I ever tried. I know what it is. I never used it. I never. Used oh, it. I think like they don't they don't make it like they did. You know, like in the the '90s and the early 2000s anymore. They've changed their formula. Yeah, yeah, it's quite well, smart. especially because well, a lot of these kids are combining with all these energy drinks now. And I, I yeah. think that's one thing that happened to me. I was drinking. I was doing so many private lessons a day, plus seminars every weekend. At one point, uh, 2015, 2016 was insane. And then I was still active duty military, and I'd still have to work out in the gym because everybody expects you to be in shape. We're in the yeah. fitness industry, whether we like it or not, and it's part of my job. I have to stay in shape, no matter how busted I am. You know, nobody wants to learn from that. You know, 340 pound black belt. No. <laughs> nah, it's true. Sorry if I'm hurting anybody's feelings, but it's true. It just sucks. Hey, I'm probably going to be that guy one day, but I'll stop teaching when that happens because I will not do it. Um, I'll keep teaching. I wouldn't want to learn from me. Huh? So keep teaching, and then, uh, you know, those in the know will just pick on you about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, that kind of dovetails. We can, we can go two directions from here, uh, and, and I'll leave it to you to decide. Like, we can either talk about uh, strength and conditioning, because you know we're talking a little bit about you know some pre workouts and stuff, but strength and conditioning is a part of the part of the conversation. Or we can move to uh, what you want the you know your personal legacy and then the legacy of uh, the Snake Pit USA. You know what what are those things? So which of those would you rather talk about? Let's, let's do a little bit of both real quick. How's that? Let me. That sounds our, great to me. Let's yeah. do a little bit of strength training stuff. Um. The stuff that I do strength training now, um, I think I mentioned this to you before, Harry. It's, I bought a uh, something that's very close to a hammer strength type machine because mm -hmm. everything that I I do nowadays kind of has to be in some form of a groove, yeah. You know, because the muscles they they don't they still know how to work together because of the, the drills that I still do on the mats and and the flow drills and things like that and plyometrics that I can I'll do when I can. Yeah. And plus grappling also keeps your body and wrestling obviously keeps your muscles working together. You know, they say bodybuilders are only good for one thing. It's miniature golf because they're busting through <laughs> so many isolation exercises that they're not doing compound movements where their muscles really know how to work together. And that's, and I, I mean, I mean, I, I like bodybuilding school and all, but it's just not something I can do. If I, do I want to be a good grappler? Then I can't be a bodybuilder. It doesn't work like that. I agree. Um, they don't go hand in hand, but you can, the good old strength training concepts that are, you know, that the, I follow a lot of the stuff with the, the uh, Eastern Block type method, which was the original place from like West Side Barbell type stuff, comes from the mm -hmm. conjugate method of training that that Louis Simmons pushes. I think is something that everybody has to look into. 
it's the strongest gym in the world for a reason. Um, obviously, sure. you've got these you've got these other guys like uh, Brian Shaw and the big guy from that TV show, and those guys, and Eddie 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 Hall is another guy who's pretty Eddie funny. Hall. Yep, these guys are in a different league, and they're not the average guys. But you got guys, any guys, NFL athletes, and all kinds of guys go to Louis, and they prepare themselves for the combines. They prepare themselves for all this stuff because he trains you to be an athlete where these compound movements and the conjugate method prepares your body to be explosive, fast, and, and just everything you want to be as an athlete. You yeah, know? strong and um, fast, not just strong or not just fast. Sure. So what I've, what I've kind of learned to do for myself, and I don't know if it worked for everybody. I can only speak for myself. It has worked for clients and, and people that are friends of mine that have worked out with me for the years and, and seen me go through the injuries that know that I'm still going to go to the gym. Um, they've always just be like, I just want to do your routine, whatever you're doing. And I'm like, all right, let's go. So I'll do a lot of isolation type things. If I can get a compound movement, if I'm feeling good, I usually end up regretting it. But since I bought this machine, I still do some isolation things, but I don't do 20 sets of body part or any crap like that. I, I kind of incorporate like a high intensity method where I'll do I'll do four or five warm up sets mm -hmm. of like 10 to 20 reps. And now, now I'm not talking about like such a lightweight where you can't feel it, but it needs to be have light enough where there's no stress on the, any possible joint issues. Like so, if I'm doing right. squats, the only way I can do squats is in that that power tech thing I got. I can get nice and low, and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not as pathetic as a Smith machine. I, just, I, always, <laughs> I always tease the guys who do squats and Smith machines because I used to be really good at squats, and I won some powerlifting titles over in Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff. So I, I loved squatting and doing the deadlifts and stuff like sure. that. And deadlifts, no chance, can't do them. I started doing Romanian deadlifts with my my wife, you know, to to build up the legs and stuff like that. And that's another reason, probably between that and that uh, pool table, <laughs> so I finished my back off before I started getting a little sick. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I focus on, I start off with a compound movement if I can. So I'm, re I'm the reason I'm saying if I can, because I'm trying to talk to everybody about this, because we all have different injuries and different limitations, right? If you're doing, if you're pretty healthy, still start with a compound exercise and then do it like what we used to call um, auxiliary lifts. And the auxiliary mm -hmm. lift's purpose is to make those compound lifts better. You know, I don't need to do 30 sets of curls or 30 sets of tricep pushdowns. I'll go do some close grip benches or some heavy dips, and that's it. And maybe maybe some V-bar pushdowns just to feel like I'm doing a little more something, you know, you know, because because I hate <laughs> being in the gym. Now, I built a nice home gym downstairs. It's nothing fancy. I like it because it's not that fancy, but it has everything I need. And just sure. packed it with as much weight as I could possibly get in there. And I really liked it. And, I, and like I said, I think I told you before, I'm not a spokesperson for that power tech stuff or anything like that. But if you guys check it out, don't buy that big giant thing because that's, that's, that's a piece of crap. I actually bought the calves, the seat, the, the, the part that attaches to it where it says you should you, you do squats on. And I felt like my knees were completely coming out and my spine was splitting in half. So I just used it for standing calf raises and it's perfect for that. Probably a little too expensive for a standing calf raise machine, but it's a great for this. I, and I and I am I hate my calves, so I, I train them all the time. <laughs> Everybody's got that one thing, right? Yeah, yeah, there's always somebody like, darn it, if I could just have that a little better, right? That one thing about our body. So uh, the conjugate method, I, combining something like the West Side barbell methodology with the com conjugate method and the compound movements with, and it's going to kind of sound about sound weird, but like the old Dorian Yates style or or. or Arthur Jones, Nautilus type stuff of that high intensity training where, but I think there needs to be more warm -up sets. I think a lot of those guys like Dorian Yates and those guys, those bodybuilders that kind of look like strong men, mm -hmm. those guys, they had that rugged look to them from that type of training, you know, because there's well, thick, I think thick there's, muscle fibers. I think that there's an injury prevention element to doing a solid warm up where, you know, like maybe the word bodybuilder is a little bit of a, of a naughty word. But a little bit of pump work in your warm up to get your muscles full of blood and good and yeah. warm and supple, especially as we age and that, you know, we, we have less and less joint mobility. Uh, if we have those muscles really, really warm and, and, you know, full of blood, you can start to feel that heat coming into it. Then you can start going to your bigger sets uh, and the, the body's willing to tolerate that load. Whereas if you went into it just like, you know, cold, now you start to run higher risk. And so, same as what you're saying. I'm not a bodybuilder, uh, but I incorporate, you know, certain amount of bodybuilder ethos into my warm ups before I go, you know, into my, my strength sets. I think it's a great idea. I mean, yes, you're basically saying the same thing I do. And right. some of the things I do, I guess they're not really bodybuilding type, but like I'll, I'll do kind of like burnout sets at the end, not to get mm -hmm. more of a pump, but to increase uh, 
lactic acid capacity. resistance. Yep. I want to be. Able, I want that have the high level of lactic acid resistance. You know, yep. you know what I'm saying? Where if you're rolling for out, if you roll for a long, like eight rounds, everybody knows what it feels like when you're like, you're, especially in the gi, your hands are like, your forearms are dead. Even without, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't lift my arms anymore. You know, or you got stuck in a submission, you're pushing out for so long or holding onto a submission for so long that your arms are like, blah, when you let go. So I'll finish off with a lot of drop set type stuff like that for like one or two sets. But like I said, one I'll do four sets of warm ups sometimes and just ease through those. And then everything I do is pyramiding just to feel yep. what I can do. To feel what my body's gonna let me do that day, and there's days where you know my wife usually works out with me, and uh, and she can there with that because I don't need somebody right on me spotting. It's pretty safe, but again, it's not it's not quite the same as a free weight, obviously, but it's not it's not as pussified as a Smith machine either. It's <laughs> it's it's like a hammer strength. If it really feels like a yeah. hammer, strength, and I like the hammer strength stuff. It's all it worked for me even when I was doing the pro football workout stuff. I was still doing my heavy parallel squats, power cleans, deadlifts, and bent, and I would do more more incline benches than flat benches than but um, it's still stuff that I can do because yeah. of that machine. So I, I try to basically to keep this simple and to, to shorten up what I'm trying to say is warm up. If you can do compound movements, do them. Don't go crazy with them. Know your limits. You don't got to do 500 pounds. I always talk about one of my best friends, Anthony Argaros. He's 50 years old. I know he could deadlift probably close to seven if he wanted to, but he doesn't. He'll go in there. I've seen him do 405 for like 30 to five reps or something like that. And he just bangs it out. You know, there's 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 no reason for anybody in grappling to deadlift 700 pounds. What are you going to do with yeah. that? They even talked about that before in at, at pro football combines I would go to and be like, okay, you bench press 225, 30 or 35 times or whatever. And you're kind of like, they're not testing your max. You know, they're not testing your max. So nobody really cares after a certain point. Even the old strength training books are like Dr. Greg Shepard from Bigger, Faster, Stronger used to talk about there's nothing ever been proven in athletics as far as like the type of like baseball, football, those types of things that like are grappling or whatever, I guess it could be the same between a 400 and 500 pound bench press or a 500 pounds and a 600 pound squat. You're not necessarily a better athlete who's faster because of that. Because once you've gotten to a certain level with that, mm -hmm. kind of maxes out your quick twitch fibers for the performance side. You can keep yeah. getting strong, but now you're going more of the power lifter route. You know, when you start getting up there more and more and more of the strong man style, because you only need so much for, for grappling. A lot of grapplers don't even really even train their legs because they're scared their legs are going to get too big to do certain attacks. You know, and I, I, I guess I get what they're saying, but I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not a guy who skips leg day. So I don't well, know. What you're, what you're saying, though, is, you know, we, we've interviewed a ton of coaches, some strength conditioning coaches, some physical therapists, uh, and – one of the concepts that just keeps coming up over and over again is whether it be in your grappling or your strength conditioning is being efficient, meaning just enough, never less than enough, but, but really not more than enough either. So if you're one, one, you know, like a sort of common standard of, of say squat strength is if you can squat double your body weight, that puts you in a pretty high category. Now you're not going to win any powerlifting meet with that. Like that's the opener at most powerlifting meets, right. but you don't need to be a powerlifter to be an effective athlete. You need okay. to have effective athletic strength and the limit, the reaching sort of the point of diminishing returns. A lot of people feel is about double body weight. So like that could be one standard. Now yours may be a little bit lower or a little bit more depending upon injury past or, you know, there's all kinds of different factors. But, but the concept that we want to have is working within our limitations to get just enough, never less than enough, but no more than enough either. Right. And you know one thing I'll say, the last thing I'll say, I, I agree with everything you said spot on. That's perfect. You said it better than I did, actually. Um, <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> where, yeah. <laughs> Put that in your Jack 3D and smoke it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Who, who's the coach now, Bane? <laughs> So I'm gonna need to call you next week and do a podcast for my new show. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. But, uh, another thing I was gonna say is, uh, if I can remember now, <laughs> thanks a lot. Sorry, bro. So, um, I try to get in and out of the gym. I'm, I, we talk about being efficient. Get in, get the job done, and get out. Um, I, I even dress like shit on purpose to make sure I remind myself I'm there to perform and get out. I'm not there to look good. I'm not putting, you know, obviously I don't have any hair, but I'm, I'm not like these Jersey short kids where they put three, pa three pounds of hair gel and they got a hundred tattoos. They don't know what the tattoos mean. They all conflict each other. They, they look like idiots in skinny jeans, but you know, I don't want to be a right person. I want to get in my junk sweatpants, my ugly shoes, you know, my baggy sweatshirt, my hat, my ball cap pulled down my headphones on and get the hell out of there. Get the job done. Do it efficient. 
give it a little intensity and do what you can. And one thing that this is what I wanted to say, no matter what our injuries are, and I've, I have 41 diagnoses away from any the brain injuries I have. I have still 41 issues throughout my body from different muscle tears from the knees, ankles, hips, you named it. She goes on and on and on. And I, and my wife's probably the only one I can list it for you because she actually went through it as a paralegal handle medical document. She's like, this is insane. I've never seen this in 12 years as a paralegal. And, uh, there's always something you can do in the weight room. There's always, there's always, if you have a decent gym that you can go to and you're fortunate enough that, that I mean, obviously right now we're all kind of screwed unless you have something at home that you can kind of do or, or follow. There's nothing wrong with calisthenics either. It's, it's, people, it's so overlooked, especially when we talk about flow drill and grappling drill, calisthenic type stuff. But there's always going to be with the machines something you can do to work around the injury. You know, I tore both my, my, my uh, what tricep head did I tear off? Both of them. I don't know. I tore the big one and the small one. My left arm, right arm. And then, uh, so I wasn't able to do push downs of any kind. I couldn't do any push downs or anything. I couldn't do close grip benches. It hurt so freaking bad. But I could do dips. I could, for some reason, I could do dips on that machine, you know, and you can really load the, you get the one where you're sitting there in the back, the pad, and then it'll go up to like 300 pounds. I could do it. And I'm like, hey, we're good. <laughs> I don't need surgery. I can still do this. <laughs> And that's how I would always look at it. I could always find some way to substitute and work around and circumvent those injuries to where I could still do what I need to do and be a part of this and keep training as we get older. You know, those injuries are obviously going to keep coming and get worse if we don't do it smart. And uh, don't be scared to try different machines in the gym. And we don't have to train like the uh, world's strongest man competitors, you know. And uh, there's nothing wrong with isolation exercise, especially when you're doing compound body movement things. And, uh, I'm not a big kettlebell guy, but I know a lot of kettlebell, kettlebell stuff is really good for the change, teaching your, your muscles how to work together. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all I got. I keep going that crap, but it's just too much. So, <laughs> so, so, and I think everything that you said was just awesome. Uh, and it reminded me of a quote from Arthur Ashe, uh, you know, and he was, his quote is, uh, start where you are with what you have and do what you can. And so everybody's got, you know, something there's some, there's some, there's nobody who's gotten out of life alive. You know what I mean? Like we're all banged up in some way, but you're, you're just saying, okay, these are the things I'm going to work with and I'm going to work either with or around it. And I, I really, I think that's a great perspective for my fellow old roller nation. You know, like don't, it's not about like being tough or making excuses and stuff. It's just trying to be better, you know, just continuously be better. There's always a way, there's always a way to get better. Even now for me, I mean, if, if the gyms were open, guess what? I, 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 my wife would tell you right now, I'd be, I'd be coaching Tuesday night. If I can't walk, I will be on that mat. I guarantee you I'll be coaching. I'll probably end up rolling, and I won't be able to walk the next day, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> it's the only thing I know how to do. And the students will never understand the pain you're in. They'll never understand what you're doing because they don't. some of them don't think it's human what you're putting yourself through because they, they don't, they don't, they're young. And... <sighs> I was just saying, like I said, I didn't think very good care of myself. And i am always been a glutton for punishment. And I almost enjoy certain pain to a point to kind of still let you know you're here and you, something, something's working right or, or whatever. But uh, as far as legacy stuff, yeah, I'm not I think too worried about my legacy too much outside of my personal life. This is a good time to move life. on to that. Yeah, I'm not too worried about my legacy outside of my personal life. The most important thing to me, um, I'm not the most, uh, I'm not a shining example of it, but I am, uh, I am a Christian. I think it's the most important thing that I can represent. And Snake Pit USA is a Christian organization. We give out 10% of our sales to uh, Christian missionaries around the world. Um, we've done that since the inception of the business. And uh, people don't like it too bad. I'm not going to change that. I, we, we, I always stand for what I believe in. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to hide it behind something and be scared. Of, you know, Oh, you're not going to like my business because you don't like me? Too bad. Go somewhere else. I'll, I'll find another fan for point zero zero two cents on an ad. On Facebook, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we, we we say we are who we are, and we say it. And I have no fear of doing that. That's important to me. Uh, obviously, I want to be a good a good husband and a good father. I got two kids in Florida. My my twenty year old don't even talk to me. She's doing her own thing, making her own path. And she's at that age now where what she's doing is between her and God. And I can't babysit her for fifteen miles away or fifteen hundred miles away. Um, I got a little one down there who's 11, and she's she's my little princess. You know, I don't get to see her that much now. Actually, we had an apartment down there for a while. While I go down, and it, being a part of their life is huge to me. Obviously, that's something that is is super important. Even my stepkids too. I do I do love. You know, they're good. They're real good kids, and the strides they've made just being around a structured environment. You know, being with me and 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 how well my wife's done with them and. and oh, 
how busy she was. She was doing everything before working two jobs, and then she was working. I think you were going to get one third job too at night with billing too on top of it before, right? It was ridiculous, and she was still doing it. And I love that. I respect her so much for that. The only legacy for me, what I was trying to say, keep it short and simple, is just a private one. Nobody needs to remember me outside of just friends and family. I mean, you can remember me now because now we're friends. But <laughs> you're in. You're in the circle. Hey, of trust. speak. Speak for yourself, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as Snake Pit USA goes, I think the most important thing is carrying on the legacies of the coaches, that the guys who came before me, and making sure what they taught is still going on. Because I think it was Gene LaBelle who said that once you teach somebody a technique, that technique is it's immortal. You know, that's a part of you that goes on forever, that technique. And, but it, it doesn't have to be a Joel Payne thing. It's, it's, I want it to be a Snake Pit USA thing for all those coaches that represent our organization, even the ones that have come and gone. If they were ever a part of it, you know, and, and students that have come and gone and had to leave for financial reasons or maybe they didn't feel like they were getting enough free shit, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Lord knows we give a lot of free crap out. So, But hey, everybody's in a different, different situation, you know. I'm just teasing, obviously. But I sure. think oh, that's yeah. the next yeah. thing we can do is we got to – to give back to people as much as we can and to be a positive part of the grappling uh, community, to not sit here and condemn judo or, or BJJ. That's not what I'm about. I, I can't, I, I'd be, nobody would even believe me if I said it coming with my background from judo and, and BJJ, but people listen to me because of my background in those things. They see me still doing judo heavy. They still see me doing BJJ heavy and I have very strong lineages in those things. And I really like doing them. I love grappling. I just love catch a little bit more. That's really it. And I think that's what we're trying to show with Snake Pit is saying that the biggest thing about that legacy would be what you're doing is cool. Check this out. You might like it. It'll probably help your game. If it doesn't, cool. No big deal. I, it, it probably will. If you pay attention, look what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, the proof is in the pudding, like I said. I mean, we got so much great feedback. I mean, we're closing in almost a half a million fans when we've been working on for so long on doing this. And, and nobody's coming close to that anymore and i work hand in hand with jake shannon a lot of times we're not um we're affiliates we don't we keep it separate because we'd probably kill each other if we tried to be partners or anything like that but <laughs> we try to do a special seminar every year together with usa catch wrestling um we try to you know keep the quality up as high as possible and whatever it was going on and not not to, not, to, not to make a monopoly or anything out of anything but to make sure the best stuff's getting pushed out there and the right people are being recognized for making these efforts you know, there has to be a douchebag filter out there sometimes, somewhere, you know. And it's like we talked about before, the douchebag filter should be the coach, not the style. <laughs> I, like that, there's, there's the meme, right? BJJ <laughs> is the douchebag filter. No, it's not. It's a douchebag magnet. And so is catch. They're, all these styles are douchebag magnets. up to the coach to be the filter, to filter out the right people to cultivate the right environment, right? Did I catch everything? <laughs> I, man, it's – you've, you've – I think you passed on, you know, so much great stuff. I think this is a, just like a perfect place to, uh, to pause for now. I want to have you back uh, for certain because there's, there's some more depth that we can get. Uh, but uh, for now, let's, let's uh, wrap up with uh, if some folks want to learn more about you, uh, what are some ways that they can, they can find you and, and learn more about you and maybe, uh, maybe reach out to you too? Yeah, so, I mean, the easiest place to start is obviously going to snakepitusa.com. Uh, so, Snake Pit USA owns Catch Wrestling Magazine, USA Catch, the International Catch Wrestling Federation. So, basically, when you, you know, when you go to Snake Pit USA, you can contact. We do have a couple people that work for us. We have a person who does shipping, a person who handles uh, information technology stuff, the website, the webmaster, and all that stuff like that. But any emails that go through contact, Snake Pit USA, hey, I'm, if you just say, hey, I'm trying to reach Coach Bain, people message me on Facebook all the time, just send me your friend request first because you won't. I can't see it if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I still do try to get to that. What I usually ask after a couple times people do it, because they'll send me their MMA fights from Indonesia. And they're, they're <laughs> using Google Translator, which doesn't work very well if you've used it enough times. Because I talk to a lot of people in, in Portuguese and Spanish, and it never comes across right. And I, and I've, at one point, I didn't suck horribly at either one of those. And now it's even worse, because Google, Google made me worse. So you have no clue what you're saying. And uh, so contact us, Snake Pit USA is usually the easiest way to reach us. Um, you can message Snake Pit USA on Facebook, the big page. It's the big fa fan the big fan page. You got over It's a quarter million fans. It's easy to find. Um if you go to any Snake Pit USA, even our affiliate schools, say, hey, I'm trying to find Coach Bain. You know, there's a Coach Bain page you can go to. It's got like 40,000 fans. And there's my homepage, anything. There's so many ways to find me. It's not even funny. I try to get back to you on Instagram, YouTube. I've been working since this, this stupid outbreak to get more involved with all the media, not just the posts, obviously, but actually 
talking to people, you know, and answering their questions. Some of them are some of the stupidest things I've ever. I mean, I always say this: there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there are some dumbass ones. It's just hey. like, what the fuck is this? I will spam you with some dumbass shit. I didn't want so. to curse this. I did. I, I dropped the bomb. You got it. You got it out of me. It's, sometimes it's like you can't fix stupid, man. You, you uh. can't stupid. You can show somebody one thing. Some people the thing a million times. They're still like, whoa. I saw quite. Here's one question. So, and I'll shut up after this. This guy goes. Gonna say, How come no catch rollers. wrestling submissions work? How come? And I'm like. <laughs> I did. I just deleted it. I didn't, I'm like, I'm not even. I'm not. I won't respond to that stupid crap because that's, that's, that's odd, odds are they're just trolling. And I have a, a troll detector up here, and we are a troll free zone. I'll block you. I don't give a crap. We're not playing again. But people that want to come in with you know a good heart and good mind to be a part of something, you got a question for me? I'll answer it. I'll give you my time. Anywhere you want to hit me up, I'll, I'll jump on there. If I, if I miss it, write me again because it gets buried because I, I do get a lot of stuff that comes in. I try to respond to everybody, but. Like I said, start Stank for USA. Go to Instagram. Go to Facebook. Um, YouTube even works too. And I'm, I'm I'm out there. Pretty easy to get a hold of if you go through those. Mm -hmm. It's hard to miss. Just search Catch Wrestling stuff. Stank for USA usually comes up pretty high somewhere. <laughs> well, uh, Joel, uh, we know you're a pretty private guy, and uh, we just can't thank you enough for uh, your time and your insights and uh, your experience and passing that along. Uh, I think you provided just a ton of value for myself and uh, my fellow old rollers out there. And uh, like I said, uh, we're going to be looking to have you on again because, uh, you know, there's a lot uh, that we missed uh, that we can still go over. And, and, you know, you got a lot to share. Sure. I appreciate it. Harry, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I look Absolutely. forward to doing the next one. Okay. Yep.